everybody, and welcome to Unapologetic Live. I'm your host, Amal Evanovi. We got Taylor in the producer's bay. Hello. And today we have a special guest. I'm not going to tell you who it is just yet, but we're doing a recurring segment that we have on the show called Explain That Tweet, where we bring on some Twitter giants to back up the things they've said on the very censorious platform. Let's get into it. Young Apollo with the Okay, welcome guys. Before I introduce our guest for today, I wanted to let you know you can like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single time we post a new video for you guys. And you should sign up for my email list, which is in the description down below. In case we ever get censored on these platforms, it's good to have a direct line of communication with you guys. So feel free to sign up. You'll get updates on Unapologetic. You'll know when our clothing line launches. You'll get our personal Discord for the show and so much more. Now, on today's show for Explain That Tweet, we have of neuroscientist, best-selling author, and host of the Dr. Deborah So podcast that's on all platforms, by the way, Dr. Deborah So. Deborah, thank you so much for being on the show. Hi, Amala. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's such a pleasure. I, I love having on strong people who are just so unabashed when it comes to the things that they believe and to do so on a platform like Twitter as we're about to get into today is becoming an increasingly brave thing to do. What has been your experience on the platform with censorship? Is this something you've dealt with? Oh boy, where to begin? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what I will say is it's not, it's definitely not limited just to this one platform. It's pretty much across the board. It doesn't really matter what aspect of social media. I would say just big tech more generally with regard to my podcast even as well. And just mm -hmm. at, at this point, you know, I've been talking and writing about these issues around gender, the science of gender for a number of years. So I am pretty much used to it at this point, I'd say, especially with the end of gender, seeing what happened when my book came out and seeing that there were some retailers that refused to sell it, seeing the things that people would say and write about me, even though it was very clear either they hadn't read the book or they were very much in intentionally misrepresenting what I had to say. So ultimately, I think all of this su suppression of information, legitimate research is not ultimately going to help people who are struggling with their gender. Um, you know, I think it's very important to take a compassionate view on these issues. Um, I think you're really great in the way that you handle it. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm excited to get into it with you because <laughs> I, I question yeah. whether anyone even sees my tweets anymore, really. I, I hope that they do because uh, they're they're much needed in the, the dialogue that we're having in today's day and age. And you, you point to something that's really important. It is important to have compassion when it comes to these issues because despite all like the political fodder you can have and going back and forth with people, there are real lives, you know, hanging in in hanging in line with these conversations that we're having that are being directly affected and negatively, as you point out, in a lot of the work that you do. So we've taken five different tweets from your account that we want you to elaborate on because you say some really golden stuff and you managed to put it in one sentence, which is something <laughs> I'm totally incapable of doing. Um, so let's start here with tweet number one. Experiencing gender dysphoria doesn't mean someone is trans. Now, when I saw this, I was like, you know what, I've actually truly never thought about it that way because so often the terms are used synonymously. You have a person experiencing gender dysphoria, it simply means they're not the gender or the sex that they were assigned, as some like to say, uh, and they must be trans. What do you mean by this? So gender dysphoria is a medical condition. It is a, a diagnosis. I don't think there should be any stigma around mental health conditions or gender dysphoria, but it's basically, it means that somebody identifies more as the opposite sex than their birth sex. Transgender, however, is a political label. So some people with gender dysphoria may identify as transgender. It's interesting because as things have changed over the years, more people, I would say, identify as transgender but don't necessarily feel gender dysphoric. So they don't actually feel discomfort in their body. They may seek to transition for various reasons, maybe social reasons, but it's not necessarily because they they feel distress at the body that they have. And I find it's really important to differentiate between gender dysphoria and the label transgender, especially when it comes to kids, because you see often that people will use this term transgender kid, trans child, whatever, I really take issue with that because children, especially, cannot 
make the decision as to whether they want to identify with this political label. Usually it's adults that are putting this on the kids as a way to, I think, garner sympathy from other people. Um, I was looking at one study recently that showed that it was something crazy, like 10% of Americans know a, a so-called transgender child. So someone under the age of 18, who I guess is either gender dysphoric or identifying as the opposite sex or as a third gender, which is a whole other thing that we can get into. Um, but it's it's really worrisome to me because I do think people with gender dysphoria, they deserve, as I mentioned, compassion, adequate care that actually addresses whatever it is that they're struggling with. Some people with gender dysphoria, especially what we're seeing more recently with this newer wave of young women and girls who are very quickly identifying as male or as a third gender and wanting to transition, their gender dysphoria in many cases, if you talk to them, has very little to do with the fact that they're uh, or their body. It's not really about gender. It's mm -hmm. more so about, say, sexism and that they're female. They don't want to be held to female stereotypes. In many cases, it's about sexual orientation. If they're lesbian and they're not comfortable with their sexuality, other times they're on the autism spectrum. There are a whole host of other reasons why they're wanting to transition or grabbing onto the label of transgender. So I think it's very important for us to try to understand why that is and have these conversations instead of lumping everybody under this so-called trans umbrella and saying, okay, one in the same, basically, whatever you want to do is your right. And that should be affirmed. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, as much as much as some people on the right will say language can never be harmful, there are instances in which, you know, using these words synonymously can be harmful, especially to kids. Uh, you, you made a point about gender dysphoria and having true discomfort in the body and more of would you call that a social contagion gender dysphoria? Yeah, I definitely think the social contagion aspect is playing a role being on social media. Many of these young women, especially they get into forums or they get peer support for identifying as anything basically other than female. I think girls especially are very empathic. You know, if they see their peers struggling, they want to offer support and, and to try and in some ways maybe feel their pain. And I also think for especially kids who are on the autism spectrum, and again, I, I think there should be no judgment for people who have autism, but I think for mm -hmm. some of them, you know, they may struggle socially. And when they come out as a different gender, third gender, or they say they want to be male, have these new pronouns and have a new name and a new, uh, whatever else comes along with the identity, identity, they get a lot of praise and they get suddenly a lot of acceptance from their peers and from teachers and basically the whole system saying that they're so brave and courageous. So I do think that social component is playing a big role. And, and again, if you talk to them about what, what is this really about, many of them, I would say, especially having developed, having a female body, they're uncomfortable suddenly with the sexual tension that they're getting. In some cases, you know, the, the changes that your body undergoes with puberty mm -hmm. can be quite alarming for some people, quite different. And no one is saying to these girls, you know, that's totally normal. That's just a normal part of womanhood in some cases. Right. I think you just perfectly segued into the next tweet that I would love for you to explain. Number two here is puberty is not an illness. Uh, what was your, your thinking behind that? Because, you know, surrounding this whole transgender argument or or the, the social uh, conversations we're having surrounding gender dysphoria, puberty is often a, a marker that is brought up. Uh, who's referring to puberty as an illness and why do you feel the need to tweet this? My sense is that many people working with kids with gender dysphoria are treating puberty like it is a disease in that it's this really horrific thing that that is going to potentially ruin a child's life um, that is increasing rates of suicide, that suicide narrative, we can also talk about that's not a fair narrative that that some clinicians are using, I think, to emotionally manipulate parents into going along with this. So obviously, parents do not want to ever think about their child potentially committing suicide. So puberty, when we look at it from a research perspective, all of the studies that we have following kids with gender dysphoria longitudinally, so basically over time, shows that the vast majority of them will desist by puberty. So with this process of their body developing, they actually grow comfortable in their body. And so they are no longer desiring to live as the opposite sex once they go through this process. So desistance has been called a myth. They say that it's outdated or it's been disproven. They say that kids who desist were not actually severe in their gender dysphoria, but that's not true. So I go through all the research literature in more in depth in my book, The End of Gender. Um, but basically, puberty is, is seen as this really awful thing that that kids with gender dysphoria should um, avoid going through this process at any costs. 
without, I mean, I understand that perspective if you believe that narrative because puberty obviously brings about changes to the body that are permanent. And if you're trying to live as the opposite sex, that's going to make it more difficult for someone to do that. But there's also a high chance that if the child does go through puberty, they will desist. So my my reasoning in that tweet, actually, I've been reading some research lately that has been talking about how in some instances, puberty is being almost viewed as a, as a disease now or as an illness. And I just don't, I don't think that's really a helpful way to view it because it's not a scientific view. I mean, <laughs> again, if people are going through this process and they feel better after and they feel fine, wh why aren't we allowed to say that? I mean, I've, I feel really lucky in some cases that I'm able to even get this message out and, and because um, it's, it's seen as controversial and I don't think it should be. Yeah, honestly, I, I feel as though you've chosen one of the hardest subjects to tackle as far as controversy and censorship. And the fact that you're still on any platform sort of <laughs> amazes me. And it, wh what you say about puberty being viewed as an illness, I think, can also be problematic in that when you view something like that as an illness, you're far more comfortable with things like puberty blockers with children. Uh, a lot of people uh, who advocate for transgender health care, as they call it, will say that puberty blockers are fine, they don't cause damage to children in any way, shape, or form, and they are utterly reversible. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we don't have any long, really long-term data for their use in kids with gender dysphoria. So I think that we should be very cautious in terms of the way we approach this. Previously, I would have said, you know, if, I, if a child reaches puberty, they're still dysphoric. If the clinician decides that that would be something beneficial for them and their gender dysphoria is persisting, then maybe in that case, you know, that should be a, a very much a confidential situation. It should not involve activism. It should not involve a larger public discourse around what should be allowed, especially the fact that we have many non-experts deciding to weigh in on this. Mm -hmm. um, but with regard to the research literature, well, I, especially I would say now with the political climate being what it is, I think it's very, very difficult for clinicians to do their jobs. They also have to worry about potentially losing their license and committing so-called conversion therapy for gender identity if they don't affirm. So I, I always want to say I don't support conversion therapy for gay people because it doesn't work, but gender is different. So anyway, to, to your point, um, the research, there have been studies to show that puberty blockers in kids with gender dysphoria is associated with lower bone density. Um, in an animal model, it's been shown that spatial memory can be affected. So this is remembering where locations or places are in space. So basically remembering directions. Also, fear response has been affected. This is in a mouse model, I believe it was. And the FDA recently updated their list of side effects for puberty blockers saying that um, brain uh, increased pressure in the brain can be a potential side effect. So I think wow. we need more research. I think we need to be, uh, as I said, a little bit more cautious. But the way that this subject is talked about, in a, it's so flagrant, and I feel it's so, every, everyone seems to have an opinion about it. Um, but I would say, especially for people who are saying things like, you know, this is totally... This is the way this is the way forward for these kids. They know nothing about the research literature. It's a real problem. Yes. And, uh, you know, I think many have pointed out that other countries who are engaging in sort of nonpartisan research surrounding this, uh, Sweden, Finland, France, are coming to the conclusion that children should not be engaged in these sort of activities. And if they are, it should be only in extreme cases. Uh, you tweeted out, and here's your next tweet, science doesn't involve censorship or intimidation. It seems like in the United States in particular, uh, there are very few nonpartisan studies as it pertains to gender dysphoria and transgender healthcare as it's been termed. How do you feel like science is being inf uh, infected by things like censorship and intimidation in today's day and age? It's really impossible. I mean, even outside of the subject of gender, it's really impossible, I would say, to do any good research, even within the sciences, that does not have a progressive bent to it. But I would say, and I say this as a liberal, so I'm like an old school liberal. Um, so, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, research should not be political. It should not be activism. It has, that has nothing to do with the scientific method. And I, I find it very disturbing to see the ways in which 
politics and ideology have come in. I mean, my own reason for leaving academia was because I just felt like the climate had become way too politically stifling. And my writing and talking about this issue, criticizing gender transitioning and children meant that I would not be able to continue on in academia. So I said, so be it. And it's definitely been for the better because it's only continued to get worse. Academia has only continued to go downhill. I was saying the last couple of years, but definitely the whole process in terms of if you're just, if you're doing research, say you want to do objective research, you have to get funding, you have to write a proposal, you have to collect your data, analyze it, submit it for publication, have it reviewed by a panel of people who are supposed to be impartial experts, and then hopefully it will get published once you make the necessary changes to it. The whole process has been corrupted now. So that from day one, I would say, especially if you want to do anything about gender or gender dysphoria, or especially with, with this population of kids, you have to decide from the outset what you're going to find. And you have to design your study in a way that's going to find it. If you are applying for money for funding, I'm pretty sure you're going to have to say in advance, like, oh, definitely, you know, we're in favor of X, Y, Z. Otherwise, they're not going to mm -hmm. give it to you. They're going to give it to somebody else. And then when it comes to, say, analyzing the data and how you interpret your findings, the best lesson I learned when I was a graduate student was that you should let your findings speak for themselves. And you don't worry about how it's going to be interpreted. I mean, you might add some caveats so that people have uh, some context around it. But you don't go in saying, oh, I was hoping to find this. So I'm going to only report right. these these particular findings and omit these other ones. And I mean, when I look at some of the newer research that's, that is coming out, it, I would say it's definitely compromised because there's no way it would be published. If you look at these scientific papers now and organizations, they will go on the record saying that they're in favor of X, Y, Z, social movement or cause. And so... I mean, you don't have any hope that your paper, if your paper says something that goes against or your research goes against that, why are they going to publish you? So now what's happening is when you have these papers coming out that are backing certain things like early transitioning in kids or whatever, then the activists can point to those, the activist organizations and whatever other organizations, scientific medical organizations will point to those papers and say, see, the research shows that this is actually what's best for these kids. And now that's going to open a whole other can of worms in terms of where we're going to go and how hard it's going to be to push back against it. Yeah, you know, I started to recognize the sort of pitfalls when it comes to researching and, and being objective in your research when I started reading Thomas Sowell and Roland Fryard, who were were doing papers and, and research surrounding race in America. And even though they were just giving their findings and saying, hey, I came in with the question, I wasn't, it wasn't a leading question, and here's what I found, uh, they were just completely berated by their own communities, even though they were approaching their subject matters with objectivity. And this is something that you're attempting to do with, with gender and with your book, The End of Gender. And I want to talk about a group that I feel as though needs a lot more studying and research, and that is detransitioners. Uh, you've tweeted out, detransitioners need to know that none of this is their fault. What did you mean by that? And how do you feel about uh, research, uh, researching this specific community? I think it's so important. I feel so badly for these I don't want to say they're kids because not all of them are kids, but many of them did made the decision to transition when they were young. And now they're, you know, in their late teens, early twenties and suddenly realizing what it meant to have made this, made these decisions. I, I would say probably one very strong theme I've gotten in the conversations I've had with detransitioners is this feeling of shame, this feeling of self blame that, I mean, at the end of the day, they did make the decision, I guess. It's questionable whether a child or someone who has, say, comorbidity, someone who has other mental health issues, can really consent to the interventions that they consented to. Um, but that is a feeling that I've gone from them. My heart goes out to them so much. And so I felt it was really important to say, you know, I'm, I didn't go through this process, so I hope it doesn't come across as patronizing to them. But to just say, like, you know, give yourself the time you need to grieve and, and don't blame yourself for it and don't be so hard on yourself because you were let down. I would say definitely with regard to the research, definitely there needs to be more. I mean, Lisa Littman recently put out um, a second study which spoke to the timeline in terms of detransition. I found it a very helpful paper, especially reading the reasons why detransitioners made the, the decision to initially transition and then detransition because for myself, not being transgender, um, I always want to know that I'm also making sense and that I'm not causing harm to anybody. And so to read the reasons why and to say, okay, I do know what I'm talking about. This is actually, ha this is actually happening. This is not me fear mongering as some people allege that I'm doing. So 
you know, as I mentioned with your previous question, it's going to be next to impossible, I think. I think it's amazing that some researchers are continuing to forge ahead with this type of research, and it, it definitely needs to be done. Absolutely. And uh, I'm, I'm interested to see, we, you, you broached the subject of, of blame and, and whether or not blame can be placed on people, and if so, who, sh- who it should be placed on. You did tweet this out, and this will be the last one. I, I could talk to you for like three hours on this subject. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> It's something we're very passionate about over here. Uh, You tweeted out that so many women are happy to endorse their own erasure. And this is, you know, sort of a tangential conversation that many are having having surrounding gender dysphoria. How do you feel about that? And is there blame to be placed on on women who are privy to this information yet endorse something like this? I would say that tweet came from watching the way some women and some women who call themselves feminists, liberal feminists who are so proud to be in favor of trans rights. And I think you, we can support the trans community, but also let's have some sense, something like unisex spaces, gender neutral spaces, trans athletes in women's sports, (laughs) trans prisoners, sex offenders, convicted sex offenders in women's prisons, why on earth would anyone think that this is a good idea? And so I was just appalled to see the number of women who claim to be in favor of women's rights. I'm sure many of them probably think they're doing something kind, but it's disappointing to see. It's really disappointing to see. And like you, you know, I'm a former social justice woke person. (laughs) And so in some ways I can understand where they're coming from because I once felt that way. But especially now it's so extreme. The activism has gone so far beyond what I ever thought it would become. And I I just am amazed, especially when I see young women who are uncomfortable, especially in say gender neutral spaces, because what we have is not necessarily trans people. I wouldn't say it's trans people coming in and doing things that would be considered inappropriate or predatory, but you have men. And in some cases, sex offenders coming in and exploiting those spaces and these poor women feel badly or feel that they should not they don't have a right to complain and i'm just i'm not okay with that yes we've created an environment that makes so many people so scared to to advocate for themselves which is the really terrifying part of this and you know you mentioned being a a former sort of social justice invested person and when I when I look at this stuff too, I have the same reaction as you. I'm kind of amazed. Like, would old me have advocated for this? I, I because it seems like it's gone so far out of the bounds on this. Do you think your old self could have maybe fallen for what's happening now? I wonder if I had gone a different path in life if I hadn't gone down the path of science. But I just think mm-hmm. it's so far removed from reality. Some of the things that activists are asking for now, I would like to think that Deborah would have snapped to her senses. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. I'm like I, I have a little bit of faith in my old self, but I don't know. <laughs> I was I was pretty pretty out there, Deborah. I like I said, I wish I could talk to you for far longer than this and we'll have to have you back because I think this is something that's going to continue to progress unfortunately and it's going to be something that we're going to have to continuously have conversations around and express but you've done that in in large part you have your own podcast you have a book called the end of gender the end of gender that's out now how can people follow what you have to say uh, a true expert surrounding these subject matters well they can find me at drdebrasso.com you can get the end of gender on my website or on Simon and Schuster's website and my podcast is everywhere on all platforms as her twitter says Deborah <laughs> thank you so much for being on the show we really appreciate it thank you so much